sector again. Uh, this is, again, I would say, a very deep crisis, uh, which we're just beginning to realize. Global output has been wiped out. Uh, if you read any of the reports of the IMF, you will see that more than 107 countries out of a total of 200 are asking for IMF bailout and support. Um, simply, the IMF does not have the capacity, does not have the money to bail out these countries, uh, all of them to the same extent. Um, so something has to be done. Already, the world has announced $8.7 trillion dollars of support um, and if you account for global GDP um, uh, that's a huge amount that already has been committed and we haven't yet started to account for the loss of jobs in the global marketplace we're just uh, hearing and reading the news in the US so the US is going to be facing a huge crisis trying to avoid the deep depression uh, so it's basically between a deep depression or a prolonged recession. And again, uh, it, the nuances are in the numbers and they will become far greater as we, uh, we get out of it. Um, uh, you're reading that global aviation is going to be depressed. Uh, therefore, for instance, a place like Singapore, which sits in the middle of this logistics trade uh, and, and supply chain force is going to be disadvantaged uh, in many ways, at least in the short term. Uh, so the Gulf oil economies are going to be the recipients of huge crisis on the exogenous side. If oil stays at $10 um, or it gets depressed even further and we go into the negative territory uh, over the short to medium term, uh, that is going to change. And my question is to many of you is what will be the price of oil based on demand and supply? Uh, demand is not going to return anytime soon. I think when it comes to demand, we have peaked globally in terms of demand. Uh, we're not going to go back to consuming 100 million barrels of oil every day. We could lose six or seven or more million barrels every day as fundamentally as human beings were changing and we are in the midst of this change, our behavior. Our behavior is being changed in the way we see our lives, our consumption, our demand patterns, and this phase of decarbonization which is taking place. So I think demand is going to be very different for hydrocarbons going forward than what we have today. So we need to ask ourselves, is the Middle East, and especially the Gulf, going to go through a, a secular, cyclical shift uh, in their economies or a more fundamental structural shift? And I would say that this is a structural shift in the way the global economy is going to and behavior, but also the Middle East and the Gulf oil producers. The oil of 60 and $70 a barrel is not going to come back anytime soon. Anytime soon, meaning over the next two years. If that happens, I will give you one very simple example. Today's uh, wages in Saudi Arabia require for the government to be paying wages, uh, an oil price of $50. Anything below that is a shortfall for the Saudi budget. So you can imagine with today's Brent at $18 and going down, uh, what will be the shortfall just for paying salaries and wages in Saudi Arabia? Another example is Bahrain. Bahrain today would require around 60% of its total budget just to pay interest payments on its debt. So its total revenues would require 60% of its total revenues in order to pay interest payments on its debt, not accumulated debt or additional debt. Um, so that creates a grave problem for Bahrain. Oman has another grave problem, which is uh, next year and for the next three years, it has accumulated uh, debt payments uh, that it needs to make on its bonds and its situation is very precarious. So it will have to decide how it's going to be bailed out and who is going to bail them out only because oil is not sufficient. So I would say that this is very much a structural shift uh, in the way these economies are based 
because this is a structural crisis where the U.S. is not going to be a, a similar economy than the one you had pre-COVID. Singapore, Singapore is not going to be the same. China is not going to be the same. And if we go into a great Cold War between uh, the two of these powers, which are aspiring and competing for the primary position in the global economy, certainly these are tectonic shifts. Um, and that is going to majorly impact the Middle East and the Gulf. What happens then to diversification and the attempts to diversify? Well, if you have been reading any articles, a lot of these economies have been trying to diversify. But unfortunately, I would say that they have not diversified either quick enough or enough. And now what is happening is that the world is in, is in this tectonic shift. And if I were to pose a question to those of you who have read one book in economics, uh, what is important is not only change, but also change in relative terms. So in relation to everybody else. So the issue and question is not, are we changing? Is the Gulf changing? But the issue is, is the Gulf changing quickly enough relative to the other countries around the world? And here the answer is that what we're going to see over the next five to 10 years in this tectonic shift that is happening is that technology is going to take over our lives much more than before. And the question is, can the Gulf change quickly enough relatively to other countries? And that remains to be seen. So far, the answer is that it is not able to change quickly enough. So the issue is, again, for Singapore, can Singapore change quickly enough relatively to everybody else? Uh, because it's not, it's not enough just to change but you need to benchmark it against everybody else. And that, I think, is the, the grave um, uh, question that needs to be asked. Um, what happens to Gulf economies uh, and their ability to have the firepower relatively to other countries to make these economies um, start again and, and avoid the deep depression? Uh, do they have the ability the fiscal and the monetary, and do they have the ability relatively to their pegs? And that remains to be seen. I think that you are going to see a differentiation now between the better placed economies and the less, more challenging economies in the Gulf. The better placed economies, I would say, are three, which is led by Kuwait, um, Qatar, and UAE followed by the less well and more challenging economies, which is Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia. That remains to be seen how they're going to escape the de de depression and their ability to get out of this deep crisis. Another question that I need to pose, which you need to think, is the following. Is the Gulf in this tectonic shift of global changes and less demand for oil still important to the global economy? Are these Gulf economies important? Are you going to ask me to return back in two years, a year, five years, to tell you what my thoughts are? Um, does the Gulf play an important role? I was earlier today on a call by a journalist asking me, is OPEC important? My answer is yes, in some ways, but it seems that Trump is more important because Trump has revolutionized and had a coup d'etat against OPEC uh, recently uh, by his interventions. Never in the history of OPEC and the world oil marketplace did we have an intervention of a US president demanding for the increase in the price of oil. Since the 1970s, we had U.S. presidents, starting from Nixon, intervening to ask for a depression, a correction in the price of oil, and certainly uh, the delinkage between oil and the Middle East, uh, dependence of oil, and uh, became a primary issue for all U.S. presidents 
for the first time, now the U.S. is intervening to see an increase in the price of oil, which is fundamentally changing, in my opinion, the way OPEC works and the importance of the Gulf in the global marketplace and in the oil marketplace. I do not say that um, oil is not going to be important. No, but oil is declining in importance. And this crisis is going to accelerate the decline of oil. And as a result, the decline in importance of the Gulf. And if you don't go very far, just Google some of the um, pundits in the Washington uh, vicinity to see, especially the neocons, the neoconservatives, to see what exactly they're saying in terms of if the Middle East and the Gulf is important. Their view, and I'm not a proponent, I'm not a neocon, their view is that the Middle East is less important for US foreign policy, and as oil declines in importance, the US is going to be less inclined to look at, at the centrality of the Gulf oil producing countries. Um, then I think it is, it is very important um, what exactly does the Gulf itself think of itself and how they encounter this post-COVID world. Very much so to how Singapore is going to think of its future. You know, are we a logistics place? Are we going to be a supply chain force? Are we going to be a service-oriented economy? Is banking going to be continuous in its uh, importance globally? Uh, for me being here, I think banking clearly is going to be less important and the service world will be less important than we are today uh, because of this crisis in many ways. So the Gulf needs to think, what else do we have to offer to the world other than oil? Are we a supply chain? Um, um, uh, yeah, region to the world? Are we going to participate in this industrial supply chain game from here on? What is our comparative advantage? And, and in many ways, the Gulf has not answered that uh, question, very important question. What is our comparative advantage, really? Is Dubai's future a, log a logistics future? Because now, over the last uh, 15 years they've developed into this logistics hub. They have two airlines of which one of them is nearly bankrupt. Um, Dubai and Abu Dhabi uh, have uh, one airline each of which one of them is nearly bankrupt. Uh, are they going to keep both? Is the world going to demand uh, more of their logistics uh, uh, support? Um, or it's going to be uh, bypassed with long haul uh, aircraft in similar ways to what Singapore needs to think as well. If you can go from London to Australia or London from Japan, what's the need? What's the need of Singapore? Uh, again, a lot of important questions. Um, so the Gulf needs to think of its centrality uh, in the global marketplace. Uh, besides being an oil producer, a petrochemical producer, a plastics producer, um, how are we going to compete? Do we have the human capital? Yes, we've educated a lot of people. And I'm very optimistic about the new people, the new breed of human capital that has been fantastically educated over the last two decades. Um, but is this enough? And the answer is, well, we don't know. Again, you need to think in relative terms uh, because who is competing with you for this position in the global marketplace? Is it the Egyptians, if you're in the Gulf? Is it the Indians? Is it the Iranians? Um, is it the Israelis? Um, um, what is our future vis-a-vis -vis all of this region? Because everybody is competing. Um, and, and, and finally, I think they need to also address the issue of sovereign wealth funds. Um, for long, because of oil revenues, the Gulf has benefited from being a net exporter of capital. They've invested in many things outside, but now the need is to invest back home. What do you invest in? Do you deploy all this money to, to, to help your, your local economies? And can it be done? In many ways, uh, you can say, yes, the smaller 
populated uh, countries of the Gulf will be able to withstand the difficulty. So the likes of the UAE, which has a fairly small population if you take out the expatriates, Qatar, which uh, has a fairly small population, and Kuwait, which again, and if you look at a population to foreign assets, you will see that all of them uh, vary between 200% uh, to GDP in terms of foreign exchange um, uh, to, to size of economy to 450% uh, GDP in terms of F FX foreign reserves um, uh, in terms of size and uh, in the case of Qatar. So the smaller countries are better placed to weather this crisis, but still there is an existential question as to what do they do later on? Can they deploy the, the assets they have outside and also can they liquidate them in order to help their economies? But also more principally and fundamentally, what exactly do they do? Yes, Dubai will postpone Expo 2020, but they have a lot of real estate which is sitting idle and prices are falling. Are they going to attract people to invest in it? Who is going to invest? The region is contracting. Are the Chinese going to be the new force? Can the Chinese visit? Uh, that is a very important question. What does Qatar do? Uh, they will host the World Cup in 2022. And then what? What exactly do they do? Uh, maybe they don't have to do anything. Uh, maybe being small is good enough for the next 50 years. Um, the same question is in Kuwait. Maybe they don't need to do anything. Uh, there are a uh, few Kuwaitis um, uh, to be taken care of, and that's a simple issue. But then fundamentally, what happens to Saudi Arabia, which is a fairly large country? It is the size geographically of Western Europe with about 23 million locals. Uh, that is a very different population mix than what you have in Qatar, which is roughly 400,000 locals. Um, the demands are, are diametrically very different. So this is what, all I wanted to say. I wanted to steer your thinking rather than to be complicit and tell you everything hanky is hanky-dory and you go back to your original books in economics and you read it. Um, it won't do you any good. I do think that uh, new books in economics are, are being written now as we experience this unique and fundamentally different crisis. Um, but this is all I wanted to say, and I'll open the floor to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, uh, while we wait for questions from some of our participants, which are, which are numbering almost 100, let me, let me start off uh, with one of your comments that you made about this uh, new Cold War. Um, uh, we've seen in recent days uh, tensions escalate as um, uh, Iran um, sort of surrounded uh, US warships um, um, in a provocative manner. And we just heard that uh, President Trump um, gave uh, an order to, to in fact, uh, take those uh, boats out if it were needed. Um, uh, do you think, um, uh, in the in the context where Iran's uh, economy is already devastated by uh, strict oil sanctions, and we still don't have any reliable information on how they're suffering under uh, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic? Uh, do you think this increases the likelihood of the Iranians uh, uh, committing further provocations uh, in the Gulf? Um, um, uh, what are your views on that, John? Well, um, uh, Iran is always a tricky thing. Um, another advice I would have to the region is that uh, it really helps to be in peace, uh, and the region has not fundamentally uh, discovered that peace has dividends in very simple terms, in, in people's livelihoods and wealth. And I think uh, that was, was uh, a fundamental issue um, uh, for, for the last 50 years or so that hasn't been resolved. Um, 
Um, Iran is always an issue and it will continue to be an issue. And if there is no addressing of all the issues between the Gulf countries and Iran, I think nobody will go and invest in many of these countries today. Um, Iran continues to be a geopolitical issue for the Gulf uh, Arab countries and for Iran itself. Um, wherever you stand on this, on this debate, whether you're pro-Iranian or pro-Gulf Arab, um, it has to be resolved. Um, um, I'm a great believer that Asia has done fundamentally well over the last 40 years because more or less, more or less, it has resolved its, its, its uh, difficulties. They're not killing each other. Uh, the Japanese and Chinese are not killing each other. Singapore is not in war over the last, you know, 60, 70 years. Uh, it is not in war and it is a peaceful place and it's safe to invest. I have a lot of respect for that. Um, in the Middle East, it's the complete opposite. Um, the Middle East, when I look at this map and I talk to investors, they always ask me, what if something goes wrong and they all kill each other? And I think that if they, if they cannot resolve the fundamental question of having some kind of peace, and I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of Israel, Palestine, uh, one state, two state solution. I, I, I think that these issues need to be resolved before they even begin to think of a common future. Um, and, I, and I think that Iran will continue to dominate this issue of geopolitics. Um, I'm not a geopolitics expert, but as, a, as an observer of the economies of these countries, there is always a lingering issue of safety, of investments, the geopolitical concern, and war. And until they resolve this, the region is not going to be the same place to attain its optimum performance in terms of FDI. And FDI is key for the Middle East. They will not be able to attract FDI unless they resolve this geopolitical concern. Thank you, John. Um, I think there are a couple of questions. Can I call on Lai Yuan uh, from the National University of Singapore to ask the question? Uh, hi, uh, thanks. So uh, what I want to ask is that uh, recently OPEC and Russia agreed to cut their production in May and June, right? But do you think that uh, do you think that they'll actually do you think that they'll continue to cut um, following this cut due to the con um, bleak outlook on the COVID nineteen crisis? And do you yes. think that them were actually really obliged to the agreement and actually cut from May to July? Right. So I think, you know, we are in this phase saving uh, situation uh, where the Russians and the Saudis are, are trying to fa save face in front of the global community um, and they'll just have to cut down more. And uh, whether they like it or not, it's uh, the situation of the demand cycle is just devastating and uh, for the short term, unrecoverable. So if, if for some reason, and already we're seeing that there is excess supply of whatever, 20 million, if there is a violation from the OPEC plus members and mainly the Russians uh, and others, um, to, to gain market share as they did before, um, unfortunately, oil will just continue sinking. And it will not recover to anything close to $30 uh, this year. Uh, in fact, this year, you should just delete it from everybody's minds. It's just, it didn't happen. You know, my kids are homeschooled, so I'm, I'm just uh, obscenely uh, disturbed that uh, we have become parents and teachers at the same time. So we're just coming to grips with deleting 2020. And I think OPEC is going to delete 2020. Uh, and unless they cut uh, tremendous supply, uh, they will be facing again. Uh, this this uh, July increase that they're envisaging, you know, the gradual increase uh, is, is, uh, is a Mickey Mouse uh, perception. Uh, they will really have to cut down fundamentally more as the news about the global economy is going to deteriorate very quickly. Um, the unemployment is going to get fundamentally um, uh, out of whack with anything we have seen 
over the, the last 20 years. Um, and that is going to force uh, OPEC to take out more supply from the market. So it's just face saving now um, to, to make them look good. Uh, but Trump is going to pick up the phone and, and ask them to, to do another cut. Uh, just before I go on to a, a couple of other uh, questions from the audience, uh, John, uh, just to follow up on your last with uh, low prices, much like higher, higher cost produce like Canada um, and Latin America to, to actually fall out first. And in that sense, you have some, some sort of silver lining for the GCC uh, countries and maybe to some extent Russia as well. Yes, yes, I do, I do agree with you, absolutely. Uh, the silver lining is there. Um, the expand, what will happen over the next uh, few weeks and months is that the expensive oil producers uh, will be taken out. Uh, the oil majors will become more major and bigger. Uh, they will consolidate. A lot of the shale producers will be taken out. Canada, the expensive producer, uh, a lot of it will be taken out. Um, so that is going to fundamentally change. But having said that, what we don't know, and this is my, my, my big question, uh, which will, we, you, happens uh, what happens to the shale producers can they just come back can the oil majors who take over the shale producers just come back and produce shale um, and is this going to be a strategic issue of priority for um, for uh, the United States that has a political angle meaning that we don't want to be linked so much to the Middle East we need to keep producing or because of climate change the climate people, the climate lobby because f becomes far more powerful and says that, look, we want to preserve the climate, shale is not good. And I do see these two debates taking off pretty soon. The climate people will begin also to have a more of evidence showing that if human intervention is, is there and they use less hydrocarbons, we do decarbonize and we do have climate change. Uh, we do we can still affect positively climate. Um, but I do believe that the expensive producers could be taken out. But the issue is if oil goes back in 21, 22 to maybe 30, 40 dollars, um, will the shale through technology come back with a break even instead of 45, 50, which is today, to 15 and 20? Because technology over the next two years will change tremendously not just shale, but technology in general. So will that be the next force? And what we don't know, and I'm not an engineer, is that can shale make a comeback? Because we haven't seen shale coming back. We've only seen shale just being involved, producing more and more and more, but we don't know how shale makes a comeback. Um, will the financial world in the US want to preserve the shale companies? Of course, many of them will be bankrupt, but will the exons of the U.S. take over and for strategic reasons come back with shale being the factor? Because shale is what changed uh, the, the oil market over the last uh, five years. We are where we are because of shale. And uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia decided in 2015 and 16 uh, not to take out shale. They decided now to take out shale, but maybe now it's too late. So it remains to be seen, but yes, I agree with you. It's an excellent point that you're making that yes, a lot of the expensive oil will be taken out and this could give a little bit of hope that eventually the cheaper producers, such as Saudi Arabia, which is producing at a cost of roughly three to five dollars, will be able to stay. Um, and, and that might be the, the, the kickoff point for oil at 30, 40, 50. Now, do I see oil at 60, 70 anytime soon, at least over the next three years? No, I don't see it. Uh, and again, I see it because besides the demand, and this is an important point I want to stress, um, there will be behavioral changes to us as individuals. And our relationship with hydrocarbons will change. Not, not immediately, but it will change. Thank you, John. Um, 
One more question. Can I call uh, Leona Seth from the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, to ask the question, please? Um, hello, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about uh, the migrant workers in the Middle East. So now that we're saying that these economies are uh, not likely to recover anytime soon, how does that change their relationship with migrant workers? Are we going to see a mass exodus? And what is the ripple effect on economies such as India and Philippines that rely so much on uh, remittance? Thank you. Excellent question. Um, Yes, I do expect a mass exodus. I do think that 50% uh, of, the, of the expatriate force in the Gulf is going to exit over the next two to three years, if not more. Um, only because these economies, uh, they have two challenges. One is create jobs for nationals, but also there'll be less economic activity and uh, they will not be able. So the first to go will be the expatriates. Um, and then there will be an attempt to keep the nationals uh, in the labor force. Um, but what we're seeing already is that there is a large number of expatriates, uh, not just from the subcontinent, but also from the Arab oil important countries that are beginning to exit. We've seen that in Saudi Arabia in 2017, from 2017 onwards. I will give you a figure. Uh, the total expatriate uh, number uh, in 2016 prior to the first wave of Exodus was about 10 million people. Today we have about seven to seven and a half million expatriates in Saudi Arabia. This number, I'm expecting it by 2023 to be three and a half million. Um, companies will have to shed expatriates. Uh, it's easier to do the nationals. Uh, there is of course a priority on that and that is going to be reflected in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, throughout the Middle East. Thank you, John. Um, yes, that's that's quite dramatic. Um, uh, the old world has has gone, uh, as you said. Uh, uh, we've got another question from an NUS person, Elson Neal. Could you please hold your question? Yeah. Hello. Thanks for giving the talk. I just wanted to ask, right? Considering that the expansion or contraction of a sector, in this case, the oil and gas sector, is not something that can be done instantaneously, right? And that since if some producers roll back production, we might see a loss of capital. Will you then foresee that in the coming years, I'm not sure, maybe like three to five years, we expect to see a spike in oil price since the production capacity has gone down? Yes, um, uh, that's an excellent question. And this is the big unknown. Uh, what uh, the optimists of the oil industry will tell you is that yes, uh, now we're not investing as much. Demand will at some point recover. You're too much of a pessimist uh, if you see oil at 20 and 30. And if the expensive oil is taken out, uh, there isn't so much investment. Demand will return, and that will force uh, oil prices up. Um, yes, this is the conventional uh, wisdom. Um, however, I would argue that um, we suffer from cognitive dissonance. Um, uh, we, we don't know exactly how we're going to recover from this crisis. Um, I don't know if, if, you, you, if you look at Europe, I don't know if you realize that since 2009, Europe has not recovered from the financial crisis. Um, and the U.S. has uh, recovered in some ways uh, in output terms, uh, more so in equity uh, markets, uh, uh, it has recovered but in fundamental ways, it has not recovered uh, its economy. So I'm not exactly sure if we're going to really go back to the mean reversion, if I am to use uh, a, a more of a mathematical term. Um, I think that we would be a little bit optimistic. And again, it's, it's not because we are stupid. As humans, we tend to, to go back to what we think we know and to our experience. So we do believe that markets will recover because they go up and they go down. Um, um, and so we do believe that uh, if there is less investment, uh, demand will pick up because the global economy will pick up at some point. People will have to uh, be economically engaged. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure that uh, the pickup is going to be as easy as we thought before. 
uh, back in 2008, remember, oil was at 147.50 cents uh, during one day. I was looking, uh, it did hit that number during the intraday trading of oil, uh, Brent that is. I never back, it never went back to 147. And since then it has been declining. So I don't see, at least as an economist uh, that has one hand, and I'm not a two-hand economist, that the evidence is there that we're going to see oil picking up uh, to maybe some $80 or $60 anytime soon or that for sure it's going to pick up to $100 uh, oil. So it could be that we might get uh, oil at 45 uh, for the future as we decarbonize and people use electric cars and hybrid cars and travel less. Uh, remember, transportation fuel accounts for between 55 to 60 percent of uh, global uh, oil demand. So if that gets reduced by 10 percent or 20 percent, uh, that changes the de demand dynamic. And um, I want to remind you that we were all talking about demand peaking, um, depending where you are, between 28 to 2034. But they were all predicting some kind of a demanding peak. And I think we, are, uh, we have peaked in demand uh, pre-COVID. So I, 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 I'm, I'm just a bit skeptical to, to say that uh, we're going to go back to the to the old normal. Thank you. Um, uh, John, there's a written out question which I shall read out to you. Uh, probably the final question before we get <coughs> Gyakumo to join us. Um, uh, how do you think the fall in oil revenues will affect Saudi Arabia's plans to diversify. I think you have some point already. Uh, he continues uh, with the question, will we see it cut an accelerated effort to divest from oil as a major revenue source? Um, Excellent. Thoughts? Excellent question. Um, if I can give you the answer, I will not be sitting here. Um, I will probably be uh, with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, or I, I will I will be in Sweden uh, uh, waiting for the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, but soon I will do neither. Uh, um, so I will give you my poor, honest answer, which is that um, um, it it uh, it the Saudis have to think uh, first of all how they're going to fight the crisis. This is a priority, and how the world will fight the crisis, and how Singapore, which I have deep respect uh, for its accomplishments, uh, I have been a student of Singapore for quite quite some time, and in fact, I visited Singapore uh, back my first time in 2008. I remember fond memories uh, where I met most of the of the authorities. I was in an official trip with the with the government. So I think that uh, oil revenues do put the economy in Saudi Arabia in a challenging situation. Uh, more so because of the economic reform agenda. Uh, I think, first of all, they need to, like everybody else, fight the crisis and manage to see what you can uh, keep alive. Uh, there will be a shortfall. And uh, the, I think the necessity to keep the economy alive will be a priority more so than diversifying at this stage the economy. Once they get out of the, the crisis, they need to reprioritize only because diversification, in the case of all the Gulf oil producing countries, requires money. It requires effort and it requires investment. Um, uh, most of these uh, plants, for instance, to develop the tourism industry, uh, requires investments from the government and the private sector. The question is what happens to the private sector? Uh, do they deleverage? Do they invest outside? Um, uh, the same goes for all the other parts of the vision, the industrial part of the vision. Uh, when, uh, announced a year and a half ago required 120 is not available today uh, and it will not be available um, so uh, do you then uh, fiscally support the country yes you do 
uh, you try to support it. But the big question is, for all of them, for how long can this low oil price uh, sustain these economies? And for how long we're going to experience low oil prices? If it's a long protracted L type of recovery and oil stays between 10, 20, and 30 dollars a barrel, this is not good news for diversification efforts. Uh, in this environment, you don't have any other resources. Um, oil revenue forms a very important part of your total revenue source. If Asia declines and requires less of petrochemicals and plastics, um, even your non-oil exports uh, face a challenge. Um, and, and then you don't have enough FDI to recoup for the lack of, you don't have a lot of resources or your private sector does because one, uh, it feels uh, less endowed, uh, less participatory, uh, but also there is less money because this is a global crisis. So does the world come and invest in your place? Well, going back to your excellent first point, which was geopolitics in Iran. Well, do I attract enough people to come and invest? Well, they, they are worried. Uh, um, and so that, that really is the totality. But in many ways, um, falling oil revenues does require reprioritization uh, and rethinking. And that impacts also the way state society formulates its pact. Um, does the state continue to offer um, endowments um, to, to its countrymen? Uh, do they offer jobs? Uh, the Gulf still employs a lot of people in the public sector, uh, very few people in the private sector. Uh, do you have enough money? To pay your your government employees uh, and so forth. Do you privatize? Well, you can privatize, but are people investors interested to be involved in a region again with a lot of uncertainties? Um, so it, it's not easy, uh, but for sure it it makes them less endowed, uh, less empowered to move ahead with all these visions when you have uh, lower oil prices. Okay, John. Um, uh, I'm told by the MEI host um, that we've got time for one question before we invite Giacomo. I see Giacomo there uh, already. Uh, perhaps we can we can uh, get uh, Giacomo involved uh, now, and and we can have a, a Q and A later for both of you um, uh, as it may proceed. So. Let me introduce my very good old friend, uh, Giacomo. Lovely to see you again. Um, uh, Giacomo is no stranger to Middle East affairs. Um, he's had a long and uh, illustrious career. Uh, we've, uh, we've already distributed his uh, bio, but just a few words about him. Um, he's scientific advisor uh, at the International Energy uh, Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po. Uh, he's had extensive uh, consulting and research experience in the Middle East. If I'm correct, I think he started consulting for the Saudi government in the mid 80s. Um, so without further ado, uh, Giacomo, uh, welcome again. Uh, can I get you to speak for about 20 to 30 minutes before we open up the floor to questions? Thank you, Tilak. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, John. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I uh, am very happy to join uh, this discussion uh, remote. Uh, uh, I remember my 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 visit uh, uh, to uh, Singapore a few uh, years back uh, to speak about uh, the Gulf and what is happening uh, in the region. And today we find ourselves in uh, some very different uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, it's a very very unusual situation that we see. Uh, so, uh, first of all, let me say uh, what my understanding is of uh, the current situation in the oil uh, and gas markets, and uh, then uh, I will uh, uh, discuss how this uh, may reflect uh, in, on uh, 
development policies and on the economies uh, of uh, the countries in the region. Uh, we have a non-precedented situation in the oil market. I think this is abundantly uh, clear, uh, not only uh, because of the price uh, shortly became negative and may again be negative later in, uh, in May uh, and probably also in June, uh, but because uh, for the first time uh, we experience a situation, uh, an imbalance in the oil market which is due more uh, to a sudden uh, uh, decrease of demand rather than in uh, uh, variations in supply. Uh, typically, in the past, we have been worried about uh, either excess supply or shortfall in supply. And typically, we have been talking or worrying about imbalances in fundamentals of the order of uh, several hundred thousand uh, barrels per day. Uh, today we are talking about uh, a sudden uh, disappearance of uh, demand to the tune of 25 to 30 million barrels per day. And that, uh, so it's uh, both in terms of size and in terms of quality of uh, the new circumstances, it's something that we haven't seen uh, before. And uh, now, of course, uh, this raises uh, multiple uh, uh, questions. Uh, how long will this uh, decline in demand, the shortfall in demand, uh, last? How quickly, uh, how quickly can uh, demand come back? And uh, is it possible for producers to cut back production to such an extent that the fundamentals in the market will be uh, rebalanced? Let me say right away that I don't uh, believe that the problem is uh, the disagreement between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia that was recorded in January, uh, the so-called price war, uh, of course, uh, the disagreement uh, in, arose from a misconception and misunderstanding of the reality of the situation on the part of both actors. Uh, neither Saudi Arabia nor uh, Russia had uh, fully understood the depth uh, uh, of uh, the uh, coming uh, collapse in demand. In, uh, so, uh, it was a, a blip uh, which probably affected production in the month of uh, April. Uh, Saudi Arabia increased production in the month of April while the correct thing to do would have been to decrease it. But again, we are talking about uh, an amount which in any case would not have made a difference uh, to the global imbalance. The global imbalance is much larger. Uh, the demand shortfall is much uh, is much larger. So that is the problem, not uh, the, the, the so-called price war. Um, now we have an agreement, uh, OPEC Plus, to reduce production to the tune of 9.7 million barrels per day, which is uh, very significant. Uh, however, uh, the arithmetic is uh, uh, quickly done, uh, you have a reduction, a promised reduction in supply of 9.7 and you have an excess, total excess supply of uh, say 25, so uh, you are uh, left with uh, an excess supply of 15, which is uh, huge. Huh? So uh, even if the OPEC plus uh, agreement is implemented uh, in full, uh, starting uh, uh, in May, we still will have a station by supply seeds demand and oil keeps accumulating in storage. And uh, that obviously is a situation which is only tenable for as long as storage is available and then it will not be tenable uh, any longer because as you might have heard it's not allowed to dump oil in rivers or at sea. So. You have to do something with it. And uh, uh, 
so uh, what can happen? Uh, there are some uh, further cuts that are possible, uh, especially in the United government in the United States. The Trump administration is certainly looking for ways to uh, palliate uh, the situation. Uh, they are speaking of uh, replenishing the, the strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, there are, uh, according to some estimates, uh, 75 million barrels per, uh, uh, of oil capacity uh, not uh, utilized in the strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, if uh, the imbalance is of the order of 50 million barrels per day, then 75 million barrels uh, meat would be filled in five days. Uh, so uh, there is a capacity there. Uh, it's not possible to fill it uh, this quickly. There is probably a limit uh, to filling, uh, to the rate of filling the, the strategic petroleum reserve of about 500,000 barrels uh, per day. So it would not take five days, it would take uh, longer, but then, you know, you only subtract 500,000 barrels from supply. So it is not clear what uh, the federal government uh, might do to substantially reduce uh, production. The uh, Secretary of Energy has said that by the end of uh, the year, he uh, expects uh, shale oil production to have declined by 2 million barrels per day, let's say even 3 million barrels per day, uh, that still uh, uh, leaves uh, a, a supply uh, excess of 12 million barrels per day, unless demand picks up. Now, on this, uh, opinions uh, urge. Some people say or expect that uh, the uh, pandemia situation will be uh, quickly resolved. Uh, in, uh, economic activity will uh, pick up again, and we will be back uh, to uh, normal a demand uh, uh, above 90 million barrels per day uh, by the end of the year. Um, on this, uh, I'm not an authority. I cannot uh, comment on, uh, on the prospects of finding a, a quick uh, solution to, to uh, the pandemic situation. Uh, but uh, what I hear and read is mostly uh, skeptical about this because we are uh, maybe reopening, but there is a, a danger of a second wave, a third wave. Uh, people have been talking uh, about uh, scenarios in which the, the virus keeps coming back periodically until uh, uh, the middle of the decade. Uh, certainly, we would need to find uh, a vaccine and uh, engage in massive vaccination across the world. Uh, the vaccine is not here yet. People are working on it and uh, it will take some time before uh, a sufficient number of people are vaccinated. So my own uh, instinct is to uh, believe that the recovery will be uh, slow and before we get uh, to a demand above uh, 90 uh, million barrels per day, we'll have uh, to wait for quite some time. What that means is that uh, prices are probably uh, going, uh, oil prices are probably going to uh, remain soft. There is a lot of uh, oil uh, potentially uh, being produced and, um, and uh, uh, prices were weak already before this all happened, already in, uh, in January or at the end of last year, uh, it was evident that prices were uh, rather soft. And uh, I uh, uh, am uh, of the opinion that we shall have to wait uh, for a long time before we see uh, prices uh, uh, recovering to, say, a level of uh, 40 or $50 uh, dollars, uh, per barrel. Now, um, what does uh, this mean for uh, the Gulf economies? Uh, well, uh, we all have uh, seen uh, the level of prices which uh, the Gulf economies, so to speak, need in order to balance uh, uh, their budget. And this is a 
level which is variable from country to country, but uh, for most countries in the region, it is uh, of the order of 70, 80 uh, uh, dollars per barrel, if not more. Uh, for Iran, which is uh, constrained in exporting very few barrels at the moment, obviously the price is very high because they are exporting fewer barrels. So it depends on the level of production and it depends on the level of prices, um, uh, on, on the level of expenditure also. So uh, if we are talking about uh, Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest economy in, in the Gulf, uh, there um, break-even uh, oil price is of the order of 80, 85 uh, dollars per barrel. And at the moment, uh, we have, uh, we will have a price of uh, 20 or less for a while, and then uh, slowly edging off towards uh, uh, 40. Uh, but uh, I would uh, personally be surprised if we see anything more than 40 dollars uh, for another uh, three, if not four uh, years uh, ahead of us. So uh, that means that uh, uh, the country needs to uh, uh, slash uh, uh, expenditure in a big way. Uh, uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, some 50% of the uh, state budget uh, goes in uh, salaries and so it is very difficult uh, to compress, uh, but uh, I would estimate that uh, anything less than uh, a reduction in expenditure uh, of uh, at least uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, would not be sufficient uh, to weather uh, the storm. It would not be wise uh, on the part of these countries to entirely liquidate uh, their accumulated reserves or sovereign wealth funds simply to finance uh, the, the shortfall uh, in, uh, in, um, in these years. Of course, they can borrow. The, uh, there is some room for borrowing, uh, but uh, you should not uh, forget that uh, everybody is borrowing these days. Huh? Uh, all the, 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 the governments of the industrial countries are, are borrowing uh, and printing money, but borrowing uh, as well. Uh, all uh, emerging countries uh, will want to borrow. In, uh, in many cases, uh, they will uh, be uh, supported because they are in very dire situations. So the access to the market, to uh, international finance on the part of the uh, GCC countries uh, uh, is uh, a question mark in my opinion. Of course, early uh, emissions uh, of the past few days have been uh, strongly oversubscribed, uh, so that means that there is a confidence at the moment, uh, but I still believe that uh, the depth of the crisis, the size of the crisis has not fully been uh, factored in uh, by the market. And so as we look ahead, uh, we, we can find, uh, we can uh, expect that sentiment uh, will be uh, probably uh, much more uh, reserved vis-a-vis uh, -vis borrowing uh, on the part uh, from, from uh, the Gulf countries. Now, what is interesting is that uh, this crisis, uh, which is a, a medium-term crisis, uh, 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 is uh, uh, coming on top of what I would call a long-term uh, existential crisis which is uh, connected to global warming, climate change, and the need to decarbonize. And uh, the uh, belief that we need to move away from fossil fuels uh, quickly, uh, as, as quickly as, as possible, drastically reduce our dependence uh, from fossil fuels. So people speaking about uh, a peak in oil demand anyhow, uh, a peak that might be precipitated by, by uh, <coughs> some medium-term crisis. And uh, therefore, uh, these countries uh, need to look strategically into their futures and, and say and decide for themselves uh, uh, what kind of uh, 
specialization uh, they want to achieve in terms of international trade, international uh, uh, division of labor. Now, many people have been talking about diversifying away from oil. <clears throat> I personally believe that the opportunities to diversify away from oil for these countries are uh, limited and uh, not very brilliant. I uh, have always believed that uh, the Gulf countries should aim at diversifying based on oil, uh, starting from oil, leveraging their uh, uh, abundant uh, reserves of oil and gas, diversifying both uh, upstream and downstream of oil production, uh, which is uh, a line uh, of uh, uh, strategic development that has been pursued uh, by several of them uh, and quite successfully so far. So the problem is uh, you need to uh, defend uh, the uh, economic value of your resource, which is uh, uh, oil and gas, which is hydrocarbons. And uh, in order to defend that, you have to prove that it is possible to rely on hydrocarbons in a decarbonized world. Now, this is possible in uh, uh, technologies to uh, achieve this have been uh, uh, discussed and uh, are known, uh, but, you know, too little uh, investment is going into this in uh, the uh, countries that should be most interested in promoting these technologies, i.e. the great uh, hydrocarbon producers. I'm uh, uh, thinking of carbon capture and sequestration. I'm thinking of the transformation of uh, hydrocarbons into uh, hydrogen or uh, other hydrogen carriers, uh, such as ammonia or other uh, uh, compounds. Uh, in, uh, I'm uh, uh, thinking of the possibility of these countries to offer uh, CO2 sequestration services to the rest of the world will be continuing to uh, uh, utilize uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, for a while, as we know. And uh, these countries, therefore, uh, theoretically, have the possibility of positioning themselves um, of positioning themselves uh, as uh, 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 in the forefront of uh, global effort towards decarbonization and preserve the, the, the value uh, of uh, their hydrocarbon industry, but they need to engage in uh, uh, massive, in, uh, 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 in massive uh, investment, uh, beginning with uh, capturing the CO2 that they are emitting they face to leverage the availability of uh, hydrocarbons uh, in a decarbonized uh, world. So that is quite different from uh, uh, investing uh, from a strategy of uh, diversification away from oil. Uh, you know, you can promote uh, tourism, uh, you can promote uh, finance, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, invest in high-tech uh, uh, companies around the world. Uh, um, all of these things have some merit, but um, uh, they are unlikely uh, to be as promising and to, to be uh, as effective as, as a basis for your future development as uh, the reserves, uh, uh, the hydrocarbon reserves that they possess. So we've, we really need, uh, a, I believe, a change in, uh, in the strategic outlook uh, in uh, a decisive turn uh, towards a, a strategy that uh, puts the defense of the economic value of hydrocarbons in the longer term at the center uh, of the picture.